Uh, let's kick off slide one with some audience participation. So, uh, hands up, logo, recognition time. Oh, yeah. Go and hit me. The, the youngster at the back? It's Mosaic. It's mosaic. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let me take you back to the, uh, the very early days of the graphical web. Uh, here we have, yes, the Mosaic browser running probably on Windows 3.1, I guess, 94, not my screenshot. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that uh, you can still get to this page if you use the web archive and pull it up on Chrome and it's still, the beauty of the web, right, everything still works, more or less. Uh, so yeah, this is a pull of the Mosaic browser homepage, early graphical browser, probably the, it was certainly the leading browser on Windows at the time, and X Windows, although it was, as I remember, big, big and bloaty on X Windows. And there were other browsers too, but the thing I really like about this is circa 93, four, uh, the, you know, the, the beginning of the graphical web, and kind of, I bring it up because I feel like with WebAssembly, we're kind of in a, a similar, maybe not quite so significant, but, a, but probably the most significant event since in terms of technology uh, that's going to sort of empower the next wave of web applications. One thing I want to remind us about is that we don't use the word cyberspace often enough anymore, uh, so I really kind of miss that. That was such a big thing. Um, I think we should maybe use WebAssembly yeah community to bring resurgence of cyberspace. Uh, the extra cute thing on here is that back in 93, 94, the Mosaic team, uh, humans kept track of everything that was new on the internet. And every new website that popped up, they kind of, they noted it and they created a page and they updated this page with what's new on the internet, which was pretty incredible because of course the internet at that time maybe didn't even change day to day, it might be a few days, and nothing would change. Of course, not much like that now. Every minute, we've got just an insane amount of uh, content creation and content consumption. Uh, but back, let me take you back to the 1st of May, 1994. Uh, and one of my favorites here is that the American Psychological Society has joined both the internet and the web, and they did this because they established both a Gopher directory and a www. So even in 94, we were a bit skeptical about whether this uh, you know, hyperlinking, Gopher was the king of hyperlinking. Uh, it was more popular than HTTP, uh, probably until about this point in time. We hit the inflection point and uh, the image tag probably sealed the deal and we were off to the races. Uh, RSB Observatory, some really kind of important sort of scientific stuff going on. Uh, and up at the top, uh, I've got a crappy little uh, quiz that I wrote in, uh, in my off time at, at, when I was studying computer science. Uh, so I've been doing this now nearly 30 years. Um, and so I was going to bring my journey of uh, writing crappy web applications right up to date. And I might even have time to do that live in the demo. So yeah, my name is Liam Crilly. I work at uh, Nginx. And this talk is about server-side web assembly and mostly about web applications, frankly. So, uh, Let's get, let's get into that. Jumping back to 94 again, uh, and this is my screenshot. I'm so glad I took it, and I still have a tarball with a date stamp, so I know exactly when I took it. Uh, I had my first web app. Like everyone else, it was like, come sign my guest book, and later on I added a counter, and we knew how many people had visited, three or four or five. Uh, but this is HTTP 0.9, straight out of CERN, HTML1, straight out of Tim Berners-Lee, and bet you could build web applications. But if you know your uh, early HTTP standards, we just have a get. There is no post, there is no file upload. We just got images, we just got fill out forms, but all of these things were ad hoc extensions on these very, very nascent standards, and everyone kind of played catch up. So Netscape did a thing, Mosaic did a thing, we like that, we don't like that, blink tags, et cetera, and the, the, the browser awards happened, and like innovation ran forwards with and standards caught up. So how do we build web applications in, uh, back in the day? 
uh, well, we had no post method and we had no bodies. Well, you could do things like this. This is version two, by the way, of the quiz. Uh, and you could have you know, fill out forms and radio buttons and do questionnaires. You could put search indexes on file systems and look for stuff. You could do interesting, useful things. I could write some software and have my mind blown that that software could run on someone else's computer and they didn't have to install any software. Right? Amazing. And we did it, we hacked the hell out of the query string. So we had query parameters and we just ran them all the way until probably the 1K limit. And uh, you could build a surprising amount of stuff this way and stuff got built. Um, but all this stuff just pushed forwards uh, without standardization and we, there are a lot of mistakes along the way. So things evolve from here and uh, as much as I'm interested in front end uh, development and progression of web apps, I'm gonna focus on the back end side here. Um, if anyone wants to reminisce about Flash, uh, we can do that after the, after the talk. So these first web apps, these things that were hacking on the end of the query string and you know, passing parameters across and you know, doing useful jobs, uh, were, we just we lent on the, the underlying Unix and POSIX system. So we sent stuff across when we got HTTP 1, right? we sent stuff across in standard input, we got stuff back on standard output, we used file descriptors in our applications or whatever, you know, or shell scripts, whatever we were running. And we sent the HTTP context, by which I mean the URI, input headers when they arrived, bodies into the application, and that's our context. Then we have a context that's got sent back to the client. The status code, you know, 200 OK, 404, whatever. Again, a bunch of headers, and then the response body, if that, you know, that's the thing. And so this HTTP context was made, you know, try to bring this into the application. So developers, people that were just hacking around, trying to sort of figure out what we could do with this new technology, uh, were able to leverage this, because the web server would just fork a process. These environment variables and file descriptors were available to the application and we could build stuff. Uh, and that took us a certain way, but it didn't scale and we had things like fast UGI come along and we were, you know, were able to manage processes a bit more smartly. Uh, and then 96, 97, we got all the components of the LAMP stack came around. So PHP, MySQL, I think came around that time. The LAMP stack just uh, was a, an amazing marketing uh, wrapper around these technologies, but it gave people huge confidence that you could choose these tools, get support, use open source, and you know, this powered really the next wave of web applications. You know, it powered the first generation of Facebook. You know, so uh, LampStack took us way forwards, and uh, because PHP had this HTTP context available to the developer as a uh, principal object, like a primitive inside the language. These were you know, types and data structures that you could, uh, I want to get a header, easy. So that was tremendous and it had its own challenges. And then the next kind of wave camp comes around when web native languages come along. So things like Python, Ruby, or Ruby on Rails in particular, made the next kind of leap forward. And every time we do this, we give developers more choice and we provide this HTTP context in a more and more native and natural way to develop. Uh, Backend frameworks like, yes, I mentioned Ruby on Rails, one of my personal favorites, Flask for Python, uh, and then the, the coexistence of the backend framework and the front-end framework to provide a really rich front-end user experience that didn't, wasn't completely re-implementing what's happening in the backend. That sort of brings us up to date. The latest cloud-native languages such as Golang and Node.js kind of take this a little one step further because what they do is they bring a web server with them. Right, so now a developer doesn't even have to throw up you know, a dev web server in front of that application code. Node.js and Golang have these things, just, they're just an inherent part of that stack. And that's good and bad. So when you deploy those applications, you know, Golang or Node.js in production, for example, you put a reverse proxy in front of them because you kind of need to guarantee a bit of scale and you usually need to do a few things at the HTTP layer that the application layer shouldn't or doesn't want to do. Uh, TLS, right? Who wants to build certificates into the application code, right? People talk about doing end-to-end -end TLS. You go to the reverse proxy and the application does, does the rest of it. So what I'm advocating for is decoupling 
the network layer that handles HTTP, and the runtime. So that's horses for courses. What happened in these earlier stages is that we allowed the web technology, the network technology to go at its own pace, innovate at its own pace, and the application runtime to do the same. And they were both able to, to go on their own journeys and be uh, extended and innovated in their own direction, and everything kept working. Like you had, you know, you followed your Apache lifecycle and got more and more features. Nginx comes along, does the same thing. Tomcat, IIS, the application code is able, and the languages are able to do their own thing as well. And as soon as we bring the two things together, we stall that innovation. Uh, not to mention separation of concerns and security boundaries uh, and giving people choices and independent control over changing each part of the stack. So, come back to this point. Because uh, what do developers really need, right? They want to be able to write their business logic, write the application code. They tend to care absolutely nothing about the bottom of the stack, certainly not at the network layer. Uh, and they don't want to be introduced to it either. Um, they might be happy understanding uh, what an HTTP request looks like uh, in HTTP 1 uh, and what a response looks like, and that's their input and output into the system. So here we have uh, a very simple, let's call it a JSON REST microservice, if you'll, if you'll uh, in, uh, indulge me, uh, that takes an array of numbers and adds them together. And someone, of course, has to deal with the, with the floating point rounding error. And so this is what the application code might look like. This is what a good developer experience looks like in this case. And I'll, I'll use Ruby again uh, as an example. Getting access to the HTTP request body is a very simple statement. Sending back an HTTP status code is sort of an implicit part of the response. It's not even a, you know, there's, there's not even a, uh, a declaration about what this is. It's just, okay, this is the end, but it must be the status code. This must be HTTP. Uh, and it allows and allowed uh, developers to build really interesting applications and only have to deal with a little messy bit in the middle where the business logic is. This is an absolute slam dunk for WebAssembly, right? We've got this request response pattern with HTTP. We've got nearly, like we've got 30-ish years of HTTP infrastructure, tooling, experience, middle boxes, proxies, caching engines, cloud services. All this stuff is ready to deliver applications at scale, proven at hyperscale with the world we live in today. And we've got WebAssembly, which wants bytes in and bytes out. Okay, HTTP request, HTTP response, uh, this is just too tempting. We can, we've got to build some really interesting things here. And so the group that I work in, uh, the Nginx saw this and thought, well, you, you, have to, you just have to do this. This, um, this is going to not only be an amazing plug-in model for extending, like the Nginx proxy that we already have, um, but it's going to be able to change what things look like at the runtime. We just need a network layer, TLS layer, HTTP parsing, request routing, and code execution. Code execution is the only thing we really care about here. Everything else is a solved problem. So let's separate these concerns. Let's minimize the application code to the sandbox, the WebAssembly runtime, because we've got pretty good solutions for handling lower down the stack, and we know the developers don't care that lower down the stack. So this kind of became a plan. Let me, uh, what we have to do, right, is, is just do some magic in the middle and get this HTTP context in and out. So, as I mentioned, right, I worked at Nginx for a number of years. Uh, I take it there's some people who know Nginx in the room. Anyone using Nginx today in their more or less daily lives or have used it in the past? Yeah, awesome. Um, anyone used Nginx unit or heard of it before? Like, we do a great job of keeping this a secret. Uh, this is a six-year-old project uh, that was created by the original uh, creator of Nginx. And after that, he wrote a JavaScript engine for Nginx, and after that, he, he, wrote, uh, he wrote unit. Um, and because it's from the original creator of Nginx, like, it's all the things that he wished he'd done differently uh, in, the first, in the first version. Uh, had been sitting on the shelf 
uh, as prototype code, and we kind of, a few things came together at the birth of this project. So yeah, it's an HTTP engine, it's a web server, it can serve static files, but the, the main difference between the Nginx project most people already know is that it is really supposed to be an application runtime. It's throwing application code. And so we've gone through this period from the LAMP stack onwards where we tend to have a web server, a reverse proxy, something that serves the static files, something that does the dynamic content. And Node.js is a great example. The reason you put a reverse proxy in front of Node.js, not because Node.js is bad or it's slow, it's really great, but you probably want to serve your static files in a simpler way. And so a reverse proxy sits there, routes to Node.js, serves static files. The sort of mission of unit was to simplify that stack. So we want to be able to basically more tightly uh, uh, configure the web server to know about the application code rather than hand it off separately. But we didn't want to tightly couple it, so it's a multi-process system. So there's a configuration control plane not shown here, uh, but most of this work is taken care of by the unit daemon router. So it's got network layer, it's got a TLS layer, it's got HTTP parsing, it's actually a little bit faster than Nginx HTTP parsing, and it's got a really nice request routing layer. And then it's got a shared memory model where it manages the processes of the application code, uh, in, in this case, uh, Python. So we talk in the language of the HTTP context for the programming language. So in Python's case, we have WSGI, we have ASGI for the async model, depending on what you're building. Uh, PHP has uh, SAPI, there's a number of different languages, each with their own uh, interface description for how the URI and the headers get across and how they get back again. And so uh, it's felt like just, this is gonna be easy. This is not our first rodeo. We've done this at PHP, Python, Ruby, Perl, Go, No, Java. Um, we've got all these backend web frameworks that we know work really well. Uh, and all we're gonna do is gonna drop, uh, we're gonna yeah, basically do some copy paste code and we're gonna drop WebAssembly in and it's gonna be great. So this was the, this is the design. We've already got this system, it's got HTTP context. We've got this nice fast shared memory system which passes across to the application runtime. Uh, all we need to do from the HTTP context which is now in an, another process is, is initialize WASM runtime. So yeah, let's use WASM time, let's have it load the module and we'll have our app process basically tell WASM time what to do, initialize the memory and we'll just copy the context in, business logic can run and we'll send it all back again. Uh, now we chose WASM time, uh, A, because it's like it's really nice and mature, uh, B, because it was written in Rust and we uh, didn't have a Rust experience for a unit. So you know, we always like to add more languages and the more we can cover, uh, the easier it is for people to have a good experience across multiple languages. And by the way, you can run these multiple languages on the same host or in the same container because it's one process managed at the top and it manages everything underneath. And because it has nice uh, C bindings. So unit is written in C, the main Nginx project is written in C, we've got lots of really, uh, good C developers, uh, and that's the, that was the, the go-to choice. So we set off about three or four months ago uh, to execute on this plan. Um, and we, no one else really knew anything about WebAssembly, and we kind of scraped our way uh, through and found out where things are happening and uh, how, to, how to make it all work. And it was tough. Uh, and so I'm speaking for the team. I'm not a C developer. Uh, I'm on the yeah, I've, I've seen a lot, right? But I'm on the, I'm on the product management side of the house uh, and I yeah, just sort of watch the team through this process. So we started where you would start in the simplest possible way. We built a kind of CGI. So this is yeah, the initial sort of forking model using POSIX standard to sort of WASM time has uh, lots of WASM stuff built in so we could do the standard in, standard out trick. Um, and we knew it was gonna be throwaway because we know it doesn't scale. So our application process launched WASM time. We call WASM time memory grow and allocate some space uh, for the HTTP context to come in. Uh, and that seemed to work, uh, more or less. And then we started writing our first WASM modules to test in this environment. And because we've got C developers, they wanted to write it in C and then compile the C to WASM. So, okay, it's not where I'd start, but yeah, go with your tool chain of choice. Uh, 
And that also kind of worked until anything beyond the most simple, small request would just segfault. So things fell over. We had memory allocation happening in our app process calling WASM time through the WASM time memory grow. And then we had the WASM module allocating memory inside its own linear memory space. And that they would just bang into each other and collide. And we had uh, lots, of, lots of problems. So turns out all of this was mostly avoidable because m not many people are going to be writing WASM modules in C. Uh, it's not, the, the benefit's not really that great. Uh, and the turns out the C toolchain is one of the least mature WASM toolchains, but we didn't know this yet. So we banged our head against the wall. We had to look at the, this is the, at the top, the top of the slide here is the uh, default WASM C linker stack and heaps layout, memory layout for the WebAssembly runtime. Uh, and the data was very small. Um, and the, sorry, the stack was very small. And so we took these three steps to finally get some reliability in our ability to write C modules that compile to WASM. So we adjust memory layout to the bottom set. So we separated the stack and the heap, and we made the, uh, the stack size a lot larger. And then we stopped trying to allocate memory from afar. So we just let WASM time initialize, and then within the WASM module itself, it asks the memory that it needs. And what we're doing today is that we're basically allocating 32 megabytes and all of the HTTP context in and out goes across this 32 meg, unless you need more. Uh, and we do this in a streaming fashion, so you can have like multi-gigabyte file uploads to a WASM module, uh, and we can do it all through this 32 megabyte interface. Unless you want, uh, you, can, you can write that out to disk, for example, without needing any more memory. Uh, and so we know this is, yeah, this is a model we use elsewhere, sort of buffering trick uh, in NGX to avoid large memory growth, uh, and this seems to be uh, a model we can also apply. But to get this working reliably, uh, this turns out to be the set of linker flags that we need to compile C code to a WASM module for our uh, runtime interface. Uh, and so as you can imagine, this isn't the first iteration of that flag. Um, we now have a library that hides all this for you. So um, we, like everybody else, we've had to write a, a, uh, an SDK to make the developer experience close to approachable. OK, so going back to you know, really what developers need. Right? We want a really easy, approachable way of just focusing on the business logic and having access to the HTTP context in and out in a really easy way. Uh, and this is our nearly fits on a slide, right? Uh, this is our best effort today. So we have a Rust SDK as well. And I know that everyone, everyone that's tried to do server side WebAssembly has had to build an SDK because the standards aren't there yet. But unlike 94, 95, 96, um, like the whole community is working together to get that stuff right. And we're not gonna have this sort of bifurcated sort of um, Wild West standards wars. Um, so it's not super pretty, but it, we don't have any unsafe blocks in our Rust code. We can now write Rust, and you, you know, this is, of course, this, you know, the simply sort of hollow world. We have access to uh, bodies not shown here. So you know, I'll sort of ask you to squint at this and imagine it's an AI inference model. Right? This, this works. And I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna push my luck and see if I've got enough time to um, do a little demo here too. So let's try this. Here's some Rust code. So I'll take you back to the HTTP um, example that we uh, saw earlier of adding numbers together. And let's take a look at this. Um, this is quite old code, so I do still have some unsafe. So let me get through the initialization phase and scroll down here, right? So we allocate 4K for all the headers, which is usually, um, 4AK is usually the limit web servers anyway. Um, we've got a dependency on uh, this JSON provider, here we get the context of the request, uh, request body, and then we do some actual Rust and iterate over this array and add the numbers together. So again, imagine this is an AI model instead, uh, when we just hack some 
raw JSON back and send content type header. So there's a complete web app, you know, 60 odd lines of, uh, of Rust, and let's run it. So I've got unit installed, and as you can see, I got this from Homebrew. So yeah, I, I did, yeah. So Ruby install unit, unit wasm, gets you everything you need here. So every runtime is a plugin module, so it's not one big uh, bloaty runtime. So I'm gonna start it up. Uh, I'll attach it to the console so we can see what it's doing, and we'll see all of the, uh, if I have a problem, we'll see the, the logs on the output. Uh, oh, yeah, and then attach it to the console. Okay, so it starts, multiple processes start, look at all my available runtimes I can use, so we're just gonna use WASM here. It is 0 0.1, it is a tech preview. And, right, I've got a controller for config, I've got the main process that handles all the processes, and I've got the route process. So, that's good, let's build this Rust. So, uh, it's a library, and we'll call it add. Let's copy that um, Rust file into lift.rs, and now let's add the dependencies. So um, unit wasm is a dependency. We have a crate for that, which influences the SDK, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, and I needed that uh, JSON library. Okay, and I think I'm ready to build. And I can't remember the WASI 32. Maybe build will help me. Yes. Okay. So half of these are just to get JSON. Uh, done. So let's have a look at target WASI. I didn't do anything smart, so I got. Uh, I forgot a thing. So, uh, this is a library, not a console application. So, we need to say that we, we need a dynamic library because it's going to be loaded by WASM time. And so, that is a. All right, I just got to cheat and add this to cargo.toml. So, I need to say that this crate type is a dynamic library type, and now I can build it again. And now I should find a .wasm file where I expect to find it. Okay, target wasi debug. There it is, all right, so add .wasm. Just because that's a null, I can't type all that. I'm gonna copy it down. And just to prove it, oh, no. right, tell you what, let me just get rid of that. I have one .wasm file, and that's what we're gonna use. So, uh, unit started, I'm gonna use, it's configured with a JSON REST interface, uh, so there's no config files apart from state. So I'm gonna use the unit C command line tool to see what, uh, it's listening on a unit socket, which is why it's a bit of a pain to use to use curl. Uh, so here's the current configuration. I've got listeners, routes, and applications. Um, let's edit this. So I'm gonna listen on port 9000. I can do all sorts of things. And what am I gonna do when I get there? Pass it to the routes. So I've only got three objects to manage, listeners, routes, and applications. Uh, as you see, routes is an array, so we get things in order. and. I'm just gonna put like a default action here just so I can make sure it's uh, working properly. Love typing JSON. Okay. That should work. Every request to this web server should send me a 204. But I screwed it up. Uh, let's do that again. Anyone that can parse JSON in real time is welcome to help me. Well, I'll do one thing at a time. Yay. Okay, that's now there.
action. So, I like that. Okay. Let's check it. Good. Good. So, let's get the WASM running. And I'm not going to type this because it's a little bit gnarly. Uh, I've got a uh, app dot JSON. So, I'm going to define an application called add. Type is WASM, so that knows what module we're going to use. Uh, and then the, the module itself, I sort of have to, we have language modules and WASM modules, and I can't do anything about the ambiguity, so sorry. Uh, so we specified the module itself, right? So I'm just going to, I ran this from the current directory that I'm in, so I'm just going to skip the whole path thing. Uh, and then these are all of our SDK helpers that allows for memory allocation to happen safely inside the WASM module um, and how to initialize and end the handler itself. So I'm just going to pass that straight to the application's object so I can reference any of these configurables directly. And that's done. And in the log output for standard error, we can see that we started a prototype, which makes spawning new processes fast, and the application itself. And I've hit PS. I've now got, so unit is now managing these application processes. There's a bunch of other config. I can say scale to 20, scale down to five, and it will auto scale the rest of it. One last thing to do, I need to attach a route to this application. So config routes currently is just doing 204 for everything. So let's do a new, add one more object, and this time we're gonna to have to match on something. So uh, match on anything. So let's match on a URI of add, yes. And what happens when that matches is the action. pass this request to the application's object slash add. We just created it. So that should stitch that together. I can match on headers or methods. I could say you know, it has to be a post. right? But that should be enough. Still can't do JSON. Let's try it again. Fetch on URI of add and action. Maybe that was it. Add, close, close, comma. Okay, let's see the whole config. All right, listening on 9,000, all requests go to routes. Routes will match on slash add or fall through to the default. So I can still, let's get my, uh, if I still send some garbage URI, I'll still get 204. Um, but let's now construct something a bit more useful. So I'll call slash add. And the nice thing about this HTTP tool is that I can construct JSON without typing it. As we know, that's challenging. Uh, so let's add some numbers together. So we sent this object and some WASM ran and gave us an answer. And there's, like, there's no other magic here. There's nothing that's happening. There's only the add to WASM file uh, and there's only the processes that Nginx managed. So uh, the, the developer experience for this allows for, uh, for Rust developers, fairly easy access uh, to uh, an environment that they know well, a tool chain they know well, and we literally just need to drop the one file in. And this really is the, why we're excited about WASM in general and server-side WASM. So I've now got that WASM file, and I want to be able to push that anywhere. I want to run that in your cloud, my cloud, someone else's server. Um, I'm going to be able to take that and self-host, run it through a test framework, and I've got one build pipeline. And that's, you know, as well as all the other amazing advantages of uh, WebAssembly around performance and security, this, like, build once, run anywhere promise is, like, 
that's, that's the real deal. So as I mentioned, like developer experience is, is king and this only works if the developer experience is great. This only works if we have universal portability across all of the server-side runtimes. So we can't wait to throw away that SDK we just spent months building because WASI HTTP and the WASI cloud world are the things that we really need for this stuff to, to, to take off. So yeah, this is the, the beginning of our journey. We're really excited to see what that's, what's already planned for WASI HTTP and, and WASI Preview 2, uh, and we start work on that next week. And if that's true, we're in a position to have the same sort of burst of innovation and separation of concerns that allows these WASM files to go anywhere for the, uh, the utility of WASM and the future of server-side web applications uh, to take to the, to the next, uh, yeah, we're back to the next, the next level. So that's it, I hope that's uh, interesting. I'll leave you some notes about uh, the NGX unit project. Um, if you're wondering, well, what about NGX proper? That's why I came. Uh, we'll be, this is the learning we'll be taking into that project to allow for extending NGINX with WASM as a plugin model. Feel free to, uh, I think I've gone over time, so you can grab me after, grab me at the booth, uh, or drop me a note, thanks.